morning. Uh, we're continuing our series on prayer. I know last week you all were blessed because Pastor Kilgore was here and it was teaching, how, learning how to mumble. Was that what it was called? And I just want to thank him so much. Um, I was unable to be here, so I'm sorry. I wish I could have been. I'd rather have been here than where I was. But I know you were blessed because Dr. Kilgore, he's just an amazing preacher. But most importantly, he's a man of God. And so this morning, before we start, I just want to make sure that each and every one of you have one of these study guides. And if you don't have a study guide, we have some, some deacons in the back who love to give you one. So if you don't have a study guide, would you just raise your hand so they can know? And if you are a child who, uh, who didn't get their study guide, would you put a thumb up? Just give us your thumbs up if you're, you, know, you, you didn't get your study guide and you're, you're, ch you're a young person that like to get their study guide. And we want to make sure each and every single one of you receives your study guide. <clears throat> And again, for, for the children, you'll look, there'll be a part where you have to count how many times I say a certain word. And you'll see there'll be the word vending machine. And if you can tell me how many times I say the word vending machine, we'll have a nice little prize for you at the end of the service. But I just want to make sure everybody gets their study guides. And as they're passing it out, um, today, uh, as we continue, we learned last week about what, or two weeks ago, about what is prayer. We learn about what is prayer, and this week we want to look a little closer into how do we pray. And as they're getting handed out, I like to get your attention is, do you remember this guy? Does anybody remember this guy? Yes. You know, he was the Verizon man, and when I looked it up, I looked Verizon man, and this is the first picture I saw. And if, if you don't recognize him, this, he was a part of an ingenious marketing campaign where they would make these cell phone commercials and they'd have this guy walking around and he'd be walking through the swamp, through the desert. There's even one where he's on Mars and he has one catchphrase. Can you hear me now? So he'll be walking around and he says, can you hear me now? Okay, good. Can you hear me now? Okay, good. He, he, he's, he was on Mars and he was like, can you hear me now? And he's like, okay, good. And as I, as I tell this illustration, I want you to know I wasn't endorsed by Verizon. I have AT&T, so don't worry. But my question for you this morning is, have you ever felt like asking God the question, can you hear me now? Have you ever been praying and felt like your prayers haven't gone further than the ceiling? Have you ever felt that way? Well, today we're going to look at how do we pray. And even more, we're going to look at the elements of prayer and if there are some roadblocks that can keep our prayers from being answered. So today, you want to be using your study, your study sheet, and we're going to go through God's word and see if God has given us a structure on how we are, we are to pray. So first, will you join me in going to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 9. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 9. And once you open it, we all know this. It's the Lord's Prayer. And I'd like for us to read it together. So it's Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. When you get there, give me a hearty amen. 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 And it says, In this manner, therefore pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And this brings me to the first one. Because do you, do you notice what the first thing when we do when we pray? We says, our Father who art in heaven. And you see, the first thing when we pray, the first thing we pray, we need to start with adoration. Because, you know, God is so amazing. You know, when you pray, we need to remember that God is the God in heaven. But not only is he the God in heaven, not only is he our creator, our sustainer, but he's our life, he's our joy, and he is love. So the first thing we do when we pray, we need to adore God for who he is. The second thing we can find in Revelation, turn me there, to Revelation chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. 
And if you look at your bulletin today, there's a lot of Bible verses, and I'm not sorry for that. So it's Revelation chapter 5, and we're starting verses 13 and 14. Revelation chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. When you get there, give me a hearty amen. 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 All right, if you, I'm sorry, we ran out of the adult lessons, but we have some more. If you didn't receive a, a study guide, will you again? Thank you. Um, so going back to Revelation chapter 5, verses 13 to 14, it says, And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard them saying, Blessing and honor, glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. So we see the second element of prayer is, is praise. And we have so much to praise God for, don't we? I want to take a moment. Let's just take a big, deep breath. All right, listen. <gasps> that was a blessing from God, wasn't it? Every breath we breathe is from God. So when we pray, we need to praise God for every blessing that he gives us. And the next one we find in 1 Timothy. Go with me to 1 Timothy, just a few books over. 1 Timothy <clears throat> chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Hmm. And it says, therefore I exert, first of all, that supplication, prayers, inter intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And, this, and the second part I want us to focus on is, and it, we can actually combine the first two together, praise and thanksgiving. But when we pray, we need to thank God and we need to praise God for everything he does, don't we? It reminded me this last weekend um, when I was in California, I had the opportunity to talk to a recently hired uh, principal. He's working at one of the major academies in Oregon, and we were talking, and he shared the story with me. Uh, he said, you know, I, I'd just been hired for a week, and I was at the Oregon camp meeting. And for any of you who ever been at the Oregon camp meeting, it's huge. Everyone goes to it. There, he was telling me that people even work their vacation around the camp meeting. And he said, so I was at this Oregon camp meeting, all these parents were wanting to talk to me, and he noticed that there was this old fellow in the corner who kept his eyes on him. He said, so finally when everybody left, this old, this old gentleman came to me, and all he said, he said hello, and he introduced himself, and he asked me a question. He said, every day do you write down your blessings? And, you know, the principal, he's like, what? You know, kind of took him out of his surprise because people were talking to him about moving in and all this stuff. And he's like, you know, I mean, I try, but I can't really say I do. And the man grabbed his hand a little tighter and said, for what you're about to do, you need to count your blessings every day. Because if you don't remember them, you'll quit. And after that, he walked away. And you see, in our, in our own lives, every day if we don't count our blessings, if we don't thank God for everything he does, when roadblocks come in our lives, we're going to be overwhelmed. So when we pray, we need to praise and thank God for everything that he does. The next thing, everything he does, and there's a, there's a quote in Ellen White in Steps of Christ, uh, page 102 to 103, and it says, we need to praise God more for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Our devotion, devotional exercises should not consist wholly in asking and receiving. Let us not be always thinking of our wants and never of the benefits we receive. We do not pray any too much, but we are too sparing on giving thanks. We are the, we are the constant re receptants of God's mercies, and yet how little gratitude we express, how little we praise him for what he has done for us. Amen. Every day we need to praise God because he continuously watches over us and blesses us. And for our next one, I'd like for you to turn with me. Um, actually, we're going to stay. I'm sorry. Um, the next one we're going to look at is petitions. And because you, you see, if you go back to 1 Timothy 2, verse 1 and 2, it says, Therefore I exert you all that supplication, prayer, intercession, and giving thanks be made for all men. And so this shows us 
as we learned two weeks ago, that we are to get, bring our petitions to God. We read a quote from Steps of Christ or two weeks ago that said there's nothing we can give to God that is too much for him to bear. It said there's no chapter in our life that is too dark. So when we pray, we need to bring our petitions, our worries, our cares to God. The next one is intercession. When we pray, we need to be lifting each other up, don't we? <clears throat> you know, I made a habit of when I pray, I have a little list. And on the list, I have people I'm praying for. And you know what the coolest thing is? The, like the coolest moment in the whole world is when I'm praying and I realize that I have to go and mark their names off because God answered my prayers. And I want to challenge you. I don't know if you've ever done it, but make a list. You're praying for them every day. Make a list and watch as God answers your prayers. Now, the next element to prayer is meditation. And if you could turn with me to Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. And when you get there, give me a hearty amen. amen. <laughs> and it says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate it, uh, meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do accordingly to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So when we pray, we need to take a time to meditate on God. Now, when I say meditate, I'm not saying that we should do as the new age meditation is, where we empty ourselves of everything. No, no. But when we meditate, we need to think about a loving God. Just like how I shared this morning, we need to think of a God who is loving. Because as we learned from the, that case study, it will actually lower our stress levels, lower our blood pressure, and lower our cholesterol. Just to think about how loving God is. So as we pray, we need to meditate on who God is and how much he loves us. And finally, for the, for the last element of prayer, will you turn with me to Zechariah 2, verse 13. Zechariah 2, verse 13. Zechariah 2, verse 13. And it says, Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for he is aroused from his holy habitation. And then next, will you go with me to Ecclesiastes 5, verse 2. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 2. And when you get there, give me an amen. 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 So it's Ecclesiastes 5, verse 2. And this is, we find the last element of prayer. It says, do not be rash when you, with your mouth, and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God, for God is in heaven. And you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. So here we see the last element of prayer. And it's silence. Because you see, I believe that God loves us, don't you? And God loved us so much that he gave us his one and only son, didn't he? So would it make sense that a God who loves us so much would want to talk to us? You know, it kind of, kind of reminds me of a scenario. I want you to imagine your spouse comes home. And they had a crazy day, and they tell you all about their day. They ask what's for dinner. They eat their dinner, and they're like, all right, good night. I'm going, home. I'm going to sleep. And, uh, you know, the first night, you'd be like, okay, okay. But let's say they did this for the next year. Would you be upset? And every time you go to speak to them, they're like, oh, no, 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 I'm busy. I'm sorry. Would you get upset? My question is, do we sometimes do that to God? We, we unleash everything that's on our hearts, but when he goes to speak to us, we're like, all right, God, I'm done praying. It's time to start my day. You see, that's why the last element of prayer is silence, is to allow God to speak to us. And when I say that, I'm not, I don't mean that God, you're gonna hear this big, deep bass voice telling you something, no. But he might bring something to your mind, a Bible verse, a Bible promise, maybe a song lyric, maybe someone that you should be praying for. So when, during your prayer time, make just a little slide and be like, God, what do you have for me today? What promises? What, who do you want me to impact? And just leave some time in your prayer for God to speak to you. So here we see the elements of prayer. So now we're going to transition and see, could there be things that could keep us 
from our prayers being answers. Could there be roadblocks to our prayers? Well, to find that out, let's go to 2 Chronicles 7.14. 2 Chronicles 7.14. Seven fourteen, And here we'll see one of the first roadblocks to our prayers. And it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sins and heal their land. <clears throat> Oh, here, then, land. So here we see that the first roadblock is sin. The first roadblock is sin because it said if they would turn from their wicked ways, he would hear them, wouldn't he? And he said that he would forgive them. So if we're clinging on to our sin, how can God answer our prayers? Have you ever seen where they, they've done an illustration where there's a marble inside a little jar? Have you ever seen this one? And they ask, the little boy goes and he puts his hand into the jar to grab the marble, but he can't get his hand out of the jar. And he goes to his mommy, he's like, mommy, 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 can you take the jar off my hand? And she tries to, but she can't get off because, she's hol because he's holding the marble. You know, it's the same thing in our lives. If we're holding on to our sins, no matter how many times we ask, we can't expect God to break the jar. So you see, when, when we pray, we need to ask God to forgive us of our sins. Now the second one, <clears throat> the, the second one we find in James chapter 1. So turn with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verses 6 and 8. And when you get there, give me an amen. 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 But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of a sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For, not, for let not the man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So you see, when we pray, we need to believe that God hears our prayers, don't we? We need to believe that God will answer our prayers. And if we don't believe that God will answer our prayers, how can we expect for him to answer them? You know, but with saying that, it's, you gotta be careful because some people say, well, you know, I believe that God will give me a Ferrari. And they pray for it, and they pray for it, and they pray for it, and will God give them that Ferrari? Most likely not. But you see, but when we pray, when we pray for things that we need, for, for strength for the day, and if we believe that God will answer our prayers. He'll do it. You know, there's a church member here who, who she always shares me. She says, every time we pray, when we finish, we need to thank God for what he's going to do. And we do, because God will answer our prayers. So for the next one, we turn with me to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 3. James chapter 4, verse 3. And here we find the next two roadblocks to prayer. And that's James chapter 4, verse 3. You ask and you do not receive, because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasure. So here we see that the next two roadblocks, and they could actually be put together, but it's selfishness and motive. Because here we see that if we pray for selfish desires, like say I pray for a Ferrari. Is that for other people or for me? That's for me. So in the same way, if, if our prayers are selfish, that'll be a roadblock for God answering our prayers. So when we pray, we need, to, we need to think, are my prayers selfish and what is my motive? So when you're praying for a Ferrari, what is your motive? That's because you want to look cool, right? In the same way, when we pray, our selfishness and our motives can keep our prayers from being answered. Now with this said, continuing on, how are we to pray then? What attitude, what divine keys are there for us to pray? What attitude should we have when we pray? So I'd like for you to go with me to Luke 
chapter 11, verses 9 to 13. Luke chapter 11, verses 9 to 13. Luke chapter 11, verses 9 to 13. And it says, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or, or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, in, your father in heaven, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? And I'd like for us to go to Psalms chapter fifty. Psalms chapter fifty, verse fifteen. Psalms chapter fifty, verse fifteen. And here we'll see the first divine key. It says, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. So the first divine key is calling upon God. And so I have a question, why do we have to call upon God? Is it because, you know, we have to remind him, hey God, I need your help? No. As our scripture said, reading says, God knows what we're going to pray before we even pray it. The reason we call upon God it, is to remind us of our need for God. So when we pray, we're saying, God, I need you. There's no other answer but you. The second one we see is found in Matthew chapter 21, verse 22. Matthew 21, verse And in Matthew 21, verse 22, it says, And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. So it's just, like the, it's just like what we learned from the roadblock. If you doubt, you won't receive. But if you believe, you will receive. So when we pray, we need to believe that God will answer our prayer. So the second one, hope. Oh, oh, faith. I'm sorry, I mixed them up. The second one is faith. And so the next one, as you already saw, I'm sorry, the next one is found in Psalm 66, verse 18. Psalm 66, verse 18. Psalm 66, verse 18. And in Psalms 66, verse 18, it says, If I regard iniquity or sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So when we pray, we need to ask God to forgive us from our sins. And as we learn that, if we ask God to forgive us our sins, he'll forgive us. So if we're clinging on to sin, as we said before, if we're clinging on to sin, God will not hear us. Which is why when we pray, we need to ask God to forgive us of our sins so that we are pure and blameless to, before him. So the next one we find in John chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. John chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. John chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. And it says, And whatever you ask in my name, Jesus, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So here we see that we need to, ask, we need to call in God's name, but we also need to pray in the name of Jesus. And why do we need to do that? Is it, is it because Jesus is like the trump card? When we pray to Jesus, God has to answer? No. The reason we pray in the name of Jesus is to remind us that we have a high priest in heaven who loves us, who cares for us, and we can trust in him. So when we pray in the name of Jesus, it's not for his benefit, 
but it's for ours. And the next one we find in John 15, 7, verse 7 and 10. John 15, verse 7 and 10, just one page over. And it says, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. And verse 10 says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So here we see our next one is abiding in Jesus. And how do we abide in Jesus? By keeping his commandments. Because it says, if you love me, you'll do what? He'll keep my commandments. And I'm not going to touch too much about this because next week, our head elder, Tom Bell, he's going to be preaching on love and obedience. But when we pray for God and, and when we're abiding in God, we're, when we're following God's will, we can have the reassur reassurance that God will always answer our prayers. The next one, <clears throat> the next one is found in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, verses 19 and 20. Matthew chapter 18, verses 19 and 20. And when you get there, give me an amen. 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 Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. So here we see that we need to be praying with others. And I'll be honest, this one, I don't fully understand. Because I know when I pray that God hears my prayer. Don't you? But there's something about praying with other people that I've realized in my life. Because when I pray with groups of people or when I pray with my prayer partners, my prayers are answered. I see God working in mar mar miraculous ways. And I can't really explain why. But all I know is that the Bible says it and it happens. And so what, what I want to challenge you, I don't know if you have a prayer partner, but I would highly recommend you have to find a prayer partner. In this world, we're not alone rangers. We're not here alone. We need each other. So if you don't have a prayer partner, please get a prayer partner. And if if you want to pray together every Mondays from 5 to 7 in the morning, we have a prayer group. Come join us. And, you know, I really don't understand this whole praying together, so I think we just all need to pray together about it, don't you? <laughs> but what we do know is that when we pray together, God said, I am there. And that is the greatest promise we can receive, yeah. that God hears our prayers. <clears throat> and, as, and as I say this, here are some divine keys, some attitudes we're supposed to have. But the, the thing about this is that all this isn't for God. This isn't for God, but this is for us. Because you see, God already wants to answer our prayers. This is just to strengthen our faith. And next, strengthen our faith. And next we're going to look at, because in all this we need to look at what is God's will. Because we looked at how we're supposed to elements of prayer, the roadblocks, and we've learned that we need to pray according to God's will by abiding with Him. But what is God's will? Well, God's will, what we can find without a shadow of doubt, are two things. The Ten Commandments and all of God's promises. The Ten Commandments because the Ten Commandments is God's moral law. It's His character. And he asked for us to obey his Ten Commandments. So we know it's God's will for us to obey his Ten Commandments. Because if you love me, you obey my commandments. The second thing is God's promises. Wouldn't it make sense that if God promised us that he wants to do something for us, he would do it? Doesn't it make sense? Well, now we're going to look at what are some of God's promises. The first one we find is, <clears throat> is in 1 Peter 5, verse 7. 1 Peter 5, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. And it says, Casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. 
So here we see that our first promise is that God wants us to cast all our burdens on him. So the first one is freedom from worries. God wants you to be free from all your worries. The second one we find is liberation from sin, which is John chapter 8, John chapter 8, verse 36. John chapter 8, verse 36. And it says, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen. What a promise that if God is, if Jesus made us free, we're free. God, Jesus wants us to be free. The next promise we have is the Holy Spirit, which is found in Luke chapter 11, verse 13. Luke chapter 11, verse 13. And we read it already. It says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? And as we had our series just a few months ago, we know what the Holy Spirit is. He's the comforter that walks beside us. And what a promise that, a promise from God is that we will have the Holy Spirit. The next one we see is found in John chapter 1, verse 5. John chapter 1, verse 5. And it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. What a promise. If we are lacking wisdom, God will give it to us if we ask. And that gives me a lot of hope because I don't know about you, but I think we've all been in situations where we have no clue what to do. But we have a promise that if we ask God for wisdom to know what to do in the situation, that he will help us. The next one we have, and this is the most amazing one, go with me to John chapter 3, verse 36. And it's eternal life. And it says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. And what an amazing promise that if we believe in God, we will have what? Amen. Eternal life. There's no greater promise. And next, go with me to Matthew 6, verse 33. Matthew 6, verse 33. But it says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And this is the great do not worry part of the Bible, where it's talking about if we seek God's kingdom first, God will take care of all the necessities of our life. He'll take care of us. All we need to do is trust him. The next one, and this is so amazing. Go with me to John chapter 10, verse 10. In John chapter 10, verse 10, it says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. What a promise that Jesus wants to give us life to the fullest. Now, does that mean we're going to have mansions? Does that mean we're going to be driving the fanciest cars? No. But what that does mean is that we will live a life of love and a life of fulfillment which is greater than anything the world can give. And that is a promise that God has given us. So when we pray for these things, we know that God will answer our prayers. The next one is found in 1 John 1, verse 9. 1 John 1, verse 9. And it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And this is a promise. I don't know about you, but I messed up. I think we've all messed up before. And our promise is no matter how bad we mess up, no matter what we do, if we go to God, if we ask God for forgiveness, what will he do? He'll forgive us. So here is a promise we have Oh, and here is one of the promises we have for forgiveness of sin. And these promises we have aren't to be 
aren't to treat God like a vending machine. You know, some people think if I quote enough promises, if I pray so much, I'll get the, what I want. And you see, that's, that's not the point of this because you see that God isn't a vending machine, but God is our creator and friend. And when we pray these promises, it's not to remind God of, oh, hey, I'm supposed to do this, but it's to give us strength to the promises that God is gonna do. Because when we pray these promises, it's to strengthen our faith and not, to give, and not to remind him of what he's gonna do. So these are the promises that God has given us. <clears throat> and, after, and after that, we also have, and I know my time is running short, but we also have some divine commands and spiritual strength. Because you see, with these promises, God has never asked us to do anything that he has not given us strength to do. And you see, in the Bible, we have these divine promises, but we also have these divine commands. And these commands are the Ten Commandments. God wants us to obey and to follow the Ten Commandments. But what's so amazing is that God is the one who gives us the strength, gives us the strength to become just like him. And the next one we have is love for enemies. The Bible says for us to love our enemies. And I don't know about you, but that's hard, isn't it? It's easier just, you know, when they slap you to slap them back. But it's through the strength of God, it's through the love of God that we are to love our enemies. And we also have joys in Philippians 4, verse 4. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And I don't know about you, but have you always felt like rejoicing? There's been moments in my life for the one thing I don't want to do is rejoice in the Lord. There's times in my life for the one thing I don't want to do is even talk to the Lord. But we're told that we are to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And the reason for that rejoicing is because we have a God in heaven who loves us so much. N the next one is gratitude. And we, we covered this before that we are to be thankful, even in the rough times. You know, joy and gratitude can be mixed. But we are to thank God even during the rough times. <clears throat> And finally, the last divine command we see is the proclamation of the gospel. God has commanded us, God has called us to tell the world about him. And you know, <clears throat> if we could actually get the screen up, if that'd be okay. And, and you see, God has asked us to proclaim the gospel to everybody. And what the amazing thing is that when God has given us these commands, it is through his strength that we are to do it. And this Sabbath was the first Sabbath of the month. And for those of you who, who come in recently, you know every first Sabbath, um, Pastor Harley and I, we've been filling the baptistry. Now the reason we fill the baptistry is because every month we believe that there are people that God wants to see in there. And, I, and I'm sorry, this whole time I've been preaching, and you can't tell, but the baptistry is full. And the whole time I've been preaching, it's been on the back of my mind that there are people out there, there are friends, family members that I know that you know that should be in there, aren't there? And you know, our last promise is the proclamation of the gospel. And you know, that's the reason we are here, isn't it? To tell the world about a God who loves them so much, who's done everything for them. A God that when you pray, he answers. A God that when you pray, he listens to you. And this is why we're here. I'd like to ask you, you know, we're talking about prayer. I'd like to ask you to take out your bulletin. And to close, I want us just to read our meditation. It's found in Steps of Christ, page 101. Because we're learning about prayer, but as we pray, we can't become hermits. And in, and in, our, in our meditation, it says, God does not mean that any of us should become hermits or monks and retire from the world in order to devote ourselves to acts of worship. The life must be like Christ's life, between the mountain and the multitude. He who does nothing but pray will soon cease to pray, or his prayers will become a formal routine. When men take themselves out of social life, away from the spirit of Christian duty, and cross-bearing, and when they cease to work earnestly for the master, who worked earnestly for them, they lose the subject matter of prayer and have no incentives, incentives to devotion. Their prayers become personal and selfish. 
They cannot pray in regards to the wants of humanity or the upbuilding of Christ's kingdom, pleading for the strength wherewith to work. You know, as we finish our short little series about prayer, we need to remember that as we pray, we need to remember why we're here. And that's to go home, isn't it? The only reason we are here is to go home. And as I was preparing this, and as I was thinking about this, this Sabbath, not having a baptism, I was thinking, have my prayers become too selfish? When I read this, have I became just like that? Because my friends, we have friends, we have family members, we have work associates that need to know about God, don't we? They need to know that Jesus Christ came and died for them. And if we're not working for the kingdom, what are we doing? So to close, I'd like for us to take a moment and to pray to God to, to help us refocus on what matters. To say, God, there's someone in, my, someone in my life that I know needs to know about you. And Lord God, may your Holy Spirit work with them. And Lord God, may you give me the courage to tell them about you. So let's just take a moment of pray to our loving God. And I'll close with prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, our God, our Lord, we learned a lot today. We learned about prayer, the elements, the roadblocks, and Lord, we, we read about your promises and your, your commands. And Lord, it's just our prayer that you help us become refocused, that our prayers have powers, and that, Lord, we can trust in you, that you hear and that you answer our prayers. Lord God, we're tired of being on this earth. We know this earth is falling apart. And Lord God, please come. But Lord, we pray that when we go, that all our friends, our family members, our sons, our daughters, our work associates, our neighbors, that Lord, they'll be there too. So Lord, give us your Holy Spirit so that we can truly be Christians after your own heart. In your name I pray, amen.